Hi there, and welcome back to Skyship Stories. In this episode, we look at the intricacies of what is needed to land a Skyship and the amount of coordination between the pilot and the ground crews. As you'll hear, Rod explains that airships are very different to heavier than aircraft, even when embarking and disembarking of passengers. Before we begin, I'd just like to shout out a huge vote of thanks to the AHT's excellent volunteer animator, Stefan Niemeyer, who has kindly offered his skills in bringing these videos to life with his wonderful animations. They take hours to produce, so we really appreciate his time, so thanks Stefan. So sit back, fasten your seatbelts as we vector the engines, push forward and up ship. Welcome to episode 6 of Skyship Stories. I did watch a few Skyship landings at Cardington and it there's an awful lot of running around by the ground crew, the sort of signalling I think the ground crew sort of chief, I don't know what you called it, foreman or whatever, there's a lot of having to watch what was actually happening and seeing which way and also whether this ship was going to sort of land or go again. Yeah. The um the crew chief. Yeah. The crew Sorry. chief was absolutely essential. And um funnily enough, lots of the crew chiefs uh were ex military. The senior crew chief in the company was Andy Allen, who'd been an RAF loadmaster on RAF transport aircraft. Mm. Um, we had a couple of ex-army NCOs. Um, one of the crew chiefs I've worked with a lot in America was a, a loadmaster on US Coast Guard Hercules. They were that sort of guy because they were part sergeant major, keeping this unruly crowd of <laughs> lads in order, uh, part technician, handling the ship uh, and part dog's body because it was the crew chief who got phoned up when anything needed to be done. <laughs> so to land the ship, you can only land into wind. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as a crosswind landing. It just plain can't happen. It isn't physically possible. You land directly into wind. So you can't use a runway in the normal sense. That's why Weeksville had this great concrete apron because without vectored thrust, the old US Navy blimps, mm -hmm. if they weren't going to take off lighter than air, had to make a takeoff run like an aeroplane and lift. But they couldn't use a runway. They needed a great area because they might go in any direction, depending on what the wind was at the time. Yeah. And similarly for landing. So you can only land directly into wind. And the wind sock might be half a mile away on the other boundary of the airfield, and it might not be reading exactly what's happening where you're going to land. Mm -hmm. So the crew chief had a little wooden stick, two or three feet long, with a little, like a kid's windsock on the top. And he would quite literally stand in the field, hold this up and have a look what the wind was doing. And he would then put his arms out and the ground crew would line up in a V shape with him at the apex, with his back to the wind, the ship is now gonna land into that V. And as the pilot, you look down and that is your windsock. Nice. You line up on what the crew chief has lined his crew up on. Mm -hmm. And it might change. So, you know, you might be three quarters of the way through the landing and the wind shifts. And if he can't maneuver everything in time yeah. and see that you can make it, the crew chief will make great big figures of eight with his windsock and you apply the power and you go around and have another go. But your aim is to fly into that V that the crew have made and arrive, touch the wheel at zero rate of descent, at mm -hmm. zero ground speed, even though there might be a 10 knot wind. So you're flying forwards at 10, well, 10 knots, um, right in the middle of the V with the ropes dangling right where the crew can take them. And uh, the crew consists of two or three parties, if you like. Two will take the nose lines that hang from either side of the nose, uh, 24 meters long, if I remember correctly, and they will pull those out at 90 degrees to the center line of the ship. Four of the guys will run into the gondola and there's a handling rail around the bottom of the gondola that you can grab hold of and it's chest height or thereabouts yeah. when the thing is sitting on the wheel. The guys on the lines under the crew chief's direction pull or 
give slack or just plain hold to keep the nose of the ship exactly into wind. Because once you slow down for landing, the rudders and the elevators start becoming less and less and less effective. On a calm day, they are completely ineffective when you're sitting on the ground with no wind speed. Um, you can't steer the ship, so they keep you into wind by pulling on these lines. Now, if it's gusty, you may have to help them. So you're doing this with the rudder, yeah, and you may be using asymmetric thrust. And I have more than once had full rudder <laughs> and full power on one engine and full reverse on the other engine because the ship is trying to do that and disappear, you know, Got into it. the side of the shed at Cardington. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, yeah. And I did see a landing. I was lucky enough to fly on a, uh, an airship, and they changed their position of where the ship was going to come down from the front of the sheds to the lower to the right hand side of the airfield and it's because the wind had changed and also there were eddies being caused by the shed itself absolutely absolutely um it, it's difficult to to visualize unless you've done this for a while because you can't see the air mm -hmm. people don't appreciate what it's doing yeah um if the wind, if there's a strong wind blowing at 90 degrees to those sheds at Cardington, the air will come over the top of the shed and curl. Down there, yeah. there'll be bits of paper and dust blowing the wrong direction as the air curls round. And those eddies will break off and roll away downwind. You do not want to be landing directly downwind of something as large as the sheds at Cardington. Gosh, yeah. So you may actually, quite literally, as you say, move the whole operation quarter yeah. of a mile round over there. Which is exactly what happens. Yeah. And and even on a routine, you know, it, it's a, an ordinary sort of day with an ordinary breeze, the crew chief may well be moving the V of lads mm. around as the wind changes. And that's why, as a pilot, you've got to keep your eye on what they're doing. Yeah. Because you've got to be into that V, otherwise it isn't going to work. You're not going to land. Um, so the way that you land it is you fly downwind. So you've got your back to the wind uh, about a quarter of a mile out to one side. Um, parallel with the landing direction, but pointed in the other direction, if you're with me. Mm -hmm. The downwind leg. During that, you're doing various checks to make sure that the pressures are right, the temperatures are right, you've got enough fuel if it all goes wrong and you have to go around and so on and so on and so on. And you are trimming the ship. And you're trimming it just a little bit nose heavy at the moment, because as you descend, it will become less nose heavy. As the air, the amount of air in the balladets changes as mm -hmm. the helium expands when you, so you trim it a little bit nose heavy downwind. And once you're three or four hundred yards past the landing point, you make a 180 degree turn to line up into the V and you can start descending at that point. And at this point, you're flying with yeah. rudder and elevator. You've still got zero duct angle, vector angle. Uh, you fly it round, you line it up on the crew and you're, you're bringing the speed back a little. Now, as you bring the speed back, you're having to make bigger control movements because the rudders are less effective. Um, and normally you would land the ship a little bit heavier than air. And you support that little bit of extra weight by flying nose up in the cruise, just like an aeroplane wing. The whole thing acts like a wing and generates a bit of lift. Yeah. As you slow down, that won't help. Mm -hmm. So the ship will start to descend if you're heavier than air. And that's when you start with the little thumb switch on the control yoke. You just start tweaking the ducts up a little bit and up a little bit more and up a little bit more so that more and more of the thrust is going downwards to help okay. support the weight. That also reduces the amount of forward thrust. So you're now trying to fly down a reasonably straight slope to land, to, to impact in the middle of the V. 
And as you slow further and further, you take a little bit more duct and a little bit more duct. And it may be that you go all the way. You may end up, if there's not much wind at all, with the props tilted 85 degrees up. Almost everything you do is supporting the weight. Very, very little forward impetus at all from that. But you're a six ton truck and so the ship will coast for a little while. And if you've judged it perfectly, you put the wheel on the ground. With the ropes dangling. A few yards in front of the crew chief. He signals the lads in. They grab the nose lines and extend them to the side. They can now keep you into wind. Yeah. And the four lads who are going to work the gondola run in and take the handling rails. And their job is to keep the ship upright. So when the, when the, the line men pull, of course, it tends to tip the ship because the wheel's on the ground and they're pulling a point which is however many metres above the ground, in 12, awesome. 13 metres above the ground. So the gondola party will be pushing the gondola in underneath. If the wind comes from the side, the ship will tend to roll and their job is to shove the gondola back underneath. And in addition, they handle the ballast. So as soon as it's on the ground, whatever the weight was, the crew chief is probably going to want it a bit heavier. Yeah. What he doesn't want is a light ship where a moment's inattention will cause it to drift away. He wants it sitting reasonably firmly yeah. on the ground. Yeah. So he'll have pre-positioned 10 kilogram shop bags where he reckons you're going to be. You land, the crew take the ropes and the crew chief will then make the necessary hand signals. He'll have told them, I think I'm mm. going to want about 10 bags in. He makes the hand signals and tells them to put 100 kilos in. Now, under the pilot's seats are ballast boxes with a little hatch on the side, the outside of the gondola down just under your backside. And as soon as you're down, the lads will unclip those and open them. And they will now, if he says 10 bags, they each put five in. If he says an odd number, there's a convention, the bloke on the left will put one more in than half. And the bloke on the, see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you don't both want to put half of 11 in. That yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You've got to work <laughs> out, yes. Gosh. Um, and they will ballast the ship. They'll just add ballast mm. and now it sits on the wheel. And it settles. Now one of two things happens. You're either going on the mast or you're going to do a passenger change off the mast in the hands of the crew with the engines running. If you're doing um, a passenger change, you can have a right mess if all eight passengers get off and take their pictures and walk away because the ship has just got eight times 75 kilos lighter. <laughs> Yes. So what you do is you make the ship good and heavy, mm -hmm. one off, one on, one off, one on, one off, one on, until everybody's changed over. And uh, there's a lightweight aluminium set of steps that hook onto the door so that people aren't having to get up oh. to chest height. You know, yeah. And they can board in a reasonably dignified way. But of course, the ship is bouncing around and it's moving in the wind. So you've got a crewman with the passenger saying now you know <laughs> yeah and, I've been, and they people step on the bottom step yeah, looking nervous i think it's it, i remember having a flight in germany i was very lucky to go on a zeppelin nt and again they explained what was going to happen and you do have to explain that it is different from embarking on a plane because it is it's almost like a, you know it's moving around it could turn at any moment yes. as you say it was one on one off and you you know that was very confusing it was it was just different to yes. what people's you know they think they're getting on an aircraft but they don't realize that the aircraft is is not stationary and is dependent on weight it's interesting that um even a helicopter but certainly a fixed wing airplane is not in flight until you take off mm -hmm. an airship is in flight from the moment you first inflate it when you're building it it's in flight when it's in the hangar. Mm -hmm. It's in flight when it's on the mast. It is actually a living, breathing animal that is flying the whole time. And you have to be constantly aware of it. Mm. Um, 
so you know, even when it's in the hangar, there's a duty pilot on the end of a telephone. Middle of the night, the phone rings. We've got a problem with such and such. And you charge in and try and sort it out. It's, it's less of a problem when it's in the hangar because the engineers mm. are in charge, really. But certainly when it's on the mast, there is a crewman with it 24 hours a day. And there's a pilot on call 24 hours a day who must be within 30 minutes. You know, it's no good saying, oh, well, I'm in Tesco's with the wife. That, yeah. that, that, that won't cut it. <laughs> Thanks again to Rod for sharing with us the challenges of landing a lighter-than airship. Join us next time in episode 7 when we look into the world of airship handling on the ground. Think you can just park an airship on the ground? Think again. Until next time, keep vectoring those engines.